I'm Mike Breen, Public Awareness Officer for the American Mathematical Society, and I'm talking with Mac Hyman, who is the Evelyn and John G. Phillips Distinguished Professor in Mathematics at Tulane University, and we're talking about uh, COVID-19, especially the modeling of it. Uh, and Mac, obviously, you're, you're looking at lots of data and stats. What are other two or three best sites uh, where you think are the best ones or where people can get information? Oh, there, there are quite a few sites. Um, so for the mathematics community, there's a, the mathematics community is galvanized around an organization called MIDAS, Models and Agent-Based Study for Infectious Disease. It's run out of NIH, NIGMS. And they maintain a site with not just the, the data for the number of cases, but for our models to be effective, we have to include uh, uh, social behavior and the change in social behavior, how people are mixing. Um, where they go during the day. Um, because with this disease, you can infect a building. If you're in a meeting room, that meeting room stays infectious after you've left. And people can come in the next day and get infected. So we need to have the social behavior inside the models. And the MIDAS site is by far the best place for that. As far as the world data and the US state by state data, the CDC has got an excellent database, uh, WHO, uh, there's a GIS database. Um, uh, now, uh, obviously, you, you mentioned models. That's an important part. Uh, what goes into creating these, and uh, what extra demands are there if, for example, a model is going to be used for a policy decision? Okay. Well, a model, we use that term generically, but it's um, they're, to work with, even within our community. You say a model to a statistician, it means something very different than it does to an applied mathematician. And our statistical models uh, identify trends underlying the data. And uh, not necessarily what the underlying cause or there's no transmission dynamics. We identify a trend and we can extrapolate that out for short terms in the future. But one of the key factors in the statistical regressions is what they're called to be effective is that the underlying dynamics that create the model or that create the data are stationary, they don't change. So if the underlying behavior and transmission network doesn't change, then these models can be quite effective at short-term predictions. Okay. But in this epidemic, we know they're changing when they're changing rapidly. As in particular, when the stay-at-home orders came in, that was a drastic uh, change in the, uh, in the, in the rep how fast the virus was spreading. Um, so what we we'll, should see with these regression models is we should see the actual number of cases start to drop off. Um, so if we made a, ch made a change two weeks ago, we won't see that change until today. And so if we notice the model was starting to, to have predict more cases than we're seeing, then we know that what was happening two weeks ago was probably effective. Okay. Now, these models aren't at all effective for, uh, say, giving the relative importance of wearing gloves or face masks or having fewer contacts or going into fewer buildings. For those, we need a transmission model where we divide the population into people that are susceptible to being infected. If they're infected, we have different levels of infectivity. Uh, those need to be captured in the model. Um, also, behavior change. Some people, when they're infected, there's a, they feel they get quite ill, and there's a massive behavior change. The simplistic models that assume people don't change behavior after they're infected are completely inappropriate for this epidemic. Um, the other thing that's very important is for this epidemic, uh, we really can't make the simplifying assumption of homogeneous mixing. When someone gets infected, they're far more likely to infect their family members than someone across town whom they've never met. And the simplistic models that assume this homoge that everyone is equally likely to come in contact with an infected person as, in as anyone else just are not appropriate. So there's a complexity in these models that we have to have before we can use them for policy. Um, luckily, there are three or four national efforts that have this level of complexity. Um, uh, Pittsburgh, Los Alamos, 
um, Northeastern, University of Virginia, and they're all coordinated through this MIDAS group. So anyone that's really interested in getting into these very detailed models, uh, the right place to go is the MIDAS website. And if you are a mathematical modeler, um, there's a portal. It's open to anyone that's engaged in mathematical modeling of, of infectious diseases. Now, the simplistic models that are, say, simple differential equation models, or we call boxes and arrows, they can still give insights for how, how you know, where it's going, but they give qualitative insights to kind of understanding what's going on, as opposed to quantitative predictions that can help public health workers. And we need to be careful in making that distinction. Yeah, and, and I think in, uh, in our first interview, uh, you talked about the, you were talking about these uh, non-simplistic models. You had, you had one that was sim, Sims on steroids. You said so that uh, <laughs> right, right, Sim City on steroids. <laughs> That's what they are. They uh, these models simulate the activities of individuals in a large city on a minute by minute basis as they go to school, go to work, uh, meet friends, and how oh, they were originally trained on a typical day. Um, and so after the stay at home orders, they've all had to be, what's nice about them is they can be recalibrated. Um, and you can have some people stay home and you can also calibrate it. Every individual by using the census has got an age, it's got an income, they know where they live. And you can base the probability that they stay home uh, on these factors. So some people may be more willing or able to stay home than others. And so that's what these groups are doing is they're looking at the effect of the stay at home order. And then after the virus or after the infection, the prevalence has been dr driven down to low levels. We'll use these models to say, okay, now let people still go, go by their daily activities again and, and see what happens. And what will happen if they don't maintain the prophylactic behavior is again, we'll see an explosion of cases. And so that kind of answers your earlier question is that these, of, you know, should we go back to normal behavior? And these models um, are demonstrating that no, if we go back to normal behavior, we have to do other things to prevent transmitting the, vi the, the virus during our normal behavior. And this will be the normal, the new normal, I think, until the vaccine comes in, which is probably at least a year. And so for the public, the sooner we get to this new normal, the more, uh, the less anxious our life will be. <laughs> And so just accept it, that we need to do things to protect ourselves that we've never had to do in the past. Uh, at least and when the new vaccine comes in, my prediction is that will be like the MMR vaccine, that all the children will get it and all the adults will get it. And so it will become, uh, it's like measles. Measles has an R naught of like 18. A single person infected with measles is likely to infect 18 other people if everyone is susceptible. This virus is, is is hot <laughs> and only after we have most people vaccinated can we then kind of relax these prophylactic behaviors um, my guess is we won't go all the way back and we'll see much milder flu seasons in the future so in some sense it's um, in the long term we actually may see some benefit by learning to behave especially when there's a, an epidemic ongoing yeah, so the, the vaccine would then bring herd immunity. Right? The vaccine would bring herd immunity. immunity. Right. And um, herd immunity for this was not just through person to person contact, it's also through these fomites. You know, the, the tables and the doorknobs act as real vectors. And so there's a, a different formula. You know, there's a uh, for herd immunity because. Uh, one person can infect one doorknob, but that doorknob can infect five other people. And the effect is, is that person has now infected five other people. So these fomites can be multipliers. So that means we'll have to have a, mu a much higher percentage of the population vaccinated than we do with the annual flu. And I think I multiplied, I put an extra syllable in immunity. Uh, and so now, Max, so it, thanks for bringing us up to date. Uh, things change so quickly here. We hope we can continue this. Uh, it, but before we leave today, is there any advice you'd like to add? Anything we didn't cover or information you think people should have? 
Oh, I, I just uh, reiterate what you're hearing on the news, that this, is, this epidemic and pandemic is real. And it's especially real for the elderly. Um, the news from Italy and China that came out is those over 80, the mortality is up to 20% of those that show serious symptoms. That's one out of five. Uh, 70 to 80 is 13 and a half percent. That's one out of every seven people with serious symptoms uh, over, uh, between 70 and 80 die. Uh, over 60 to 70 is three and a half and then it drops down drastically. So especially for the elderly, um, to take extra precautions to protect yourself. That's the self-protection. For the younger people, what we really need to do is to use these prophylactic measures like the hand gloves and the, and the mask to keep from infecting others. And even a simple cloth mask is good. If, you if, you're, if you're infected and you don't know you're infected, a simple cloth mask will capture most of the, um, uh, uh, at least the virus that's encapsulated in, in, in water vapor. So that's the main thing I, I want to pass on is that this is, this is not a drill. And, uh, and, and part of the danger is that people can have it and in, infect other people but not know. Right. And like I said, it's especially important for the younger people to realize that when they wear a mask and hand, wearing gloves, uh, the real benefit of that is they're, they're preventing infecting older people, many of whom may be their loved ones, their parents, their grandparents. So even though they may feel perfectly healthy because young people seem to be able to fight this off, uh, wearing that protective gear uh, can really protect the people they love. So. All right, Mac. Well, so thanks for bringing us up to date and for giving us all that information. Uh, that's Mac Hyman, who's at Tulane University and is the Evelyn and John G. Phillips Distinguished Professor in Mathematics. And he's talking to us now for the second time about COVID-19 and giving us advice and information. And we hope we can do it again maybe next week, Mac. Okay, Mike. That's right. good. good talking to you again. Okay. All right. Stay well, safe and stay sane. <laughs>